Hi class, welcome to um, what's going to be one of the many lectures that you are going to be um, watching uh, by distance online um, in this course, History um, 101. And I want to welcome you to a formal lecture portion um, of this course. Um, and just a heads up, I might have said this in the introduction, um, the first introduction you were supposed to watch, um, but this week or the first series of lectures in the first three weeks might feel slightly um, intense in the sense that we might be covering um, a whole bunch of the material. Um, so just heads up, you should buckle up and uh, prepare for a fairly intense course of lectures. Um, however, I do promise um, that things are going to be tapering off as we are going to be closing with our semester. So for first few weeks, just uh, stick around, stick to your schedule. Please do watch your lectures, preferably on the day that they are posted, so that way you are not starting to um, fall behind on the required materials um, that are going to be in your exams. Firstly, of course, the exam number one. So first topic uh, we are going to be covering this week is going to be um, kind of like the brief history of humans, um, from the earliest Homo sapiens, through first civilizations, through first empires, and so on and so forth. So, common academic as well as the um, historic narrative kind of dictates that we begin our discussion of Western civilizations um, in the territory that is known as the Mesopotamia, right? This kind of uh, a territory sandwiched between Mediterranean Sea and the Persian Gulf, where historians believe that the first forms of Western civilizations, as well as civilizations in general, are going to appear. However, um, the question that we are first going to address in this course is going to be how did we get here, right? We know that humans didn't just suddenly one day out of nowhere start to appear in Mesopotamia, uh, just start to build cities out of nowhere in Mesopotamia. So our question is going to be why Mesopotamia? Why would we end up um, in this area to begin with? And understanding how did we as human species get there in the first place might help us um, in answering why civilizations will first start in Mesopotamia. And to answer that question, we first need to dial our clocks back, very back, uh, briefly, uh, to a much earlier age, to precisely 2.5 million years ago. Now, scientists, and by that I mean biologists, anthropologists, paleontologists, geologists too, uh, they believe that humans first evolved 2.5 million years ago in the South and Eastern Africa from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus. And Australopithecus is simply, my Google translation is having a hard time spelling at Australopithecus, but here is the word for you. And the translation of Australopithecus from Latin simply means the southern ape. In fact, based on the fossil excavation, archaeologists had determined that human origins can be tracked down to the collection of bones, also known as quote-unquote Lucy. And this is the skeletons or remainder of the collection amalgamation of bones you are currently looking on the slide. So what you see on the picture is the Lucy. And Lucy, or um, remains of Lucy, were found in um, 1970s um, in, the east, in what today is called the country of Ethiopia um, in the eastern portions of Africa, right? And scientists claim that Lucy, 
or this collection of bones um, to be the quote unquote grandmother of humanity, which is to say that um, within the homo genus, which is sort of like a broad category uh, under which eventually humans, homo sapiens will also fall under, uh, us humans are also part of the quote unquote homo genus as is the Lucy, right? And within this homo genus, it is possible to find the DNA strains that can be traced traced back to this collection of fossilized bones that we collectively call Lucy, right? Um, and this is why we also say that Lucy is perhaps our founding matriarch, right? So in other words, um, Lucy is the oldest species uh, with which humans share a similar DNA, not the same, but similar DNA. And her skeleton suggestion, uh, her skeleton uh, uh, structure also suggests uh, a number of things that will kind of link her to similarities with Homo sapiens in that she was fully bipedal, meaning that she was walking upright using two of her legs as opposed to other species before her and after her who will walk on four legs. So this is kind of her similarity with how humans will evolve as well. Um, and scientists will conclude that she is female because her bone structure were of a smaller stature, right? Um, and her skeleton remains also suggest that Lucy as well as the other species with shared human DNA had been present in Africa and are dated to uh, 3.2 million years of age. So Lucy's age is 3.2 million, right? Um, and archeologists also found um, the first evidence of tool production from the same period in the same place in Ethiopia, in the very same region that Lucy was excavated as well, kind of suggesting to us that other species that came uh, uh, long before Homo sapiens will evolve will also be number one bipedal using two legs, but also using tools that Homo sapiens will use as well. All right, um, so species that shared DNA with later humans evolved um, 3.2 million years ago with Lucy being kind of the first found example. Um, then about 2.5 million years ago, some of these ancient species uh, of the Homo genus, again, Homo being this umbrella term of different types of species, um, will start to also spread around in the portions of the African continent, in the portions of Europe and in the portions of Asia. And there would be different kinds of species inside of this Homo genus that will start to involve in these regions. And for example, if we were uh, to look at the map, uh, we could see that, for instance, there was a species known as the Homo erectus uh, or the upright uh, species. Um, and it was populating the uh, Western and Northern portions of Africa, the um, Arabian Peninsula, and also Southern portions of Asia. And there was also a different kind of species from a different category known as the Homo Neanderthalis. And Neanderthalis, uh, Neanderthalis was predominantly present in portions of Europe and portions of what we today know as the Middle East. Also, I, I do believe the one that was most recent discovered is the Homo Denisova. And Homo Denisova was found here in the northern portions of what today is uh, Russia in the Siberian region, right? Um, and numerous new species continue to develop all across the world. And actually, who knows how many more of these distant relatives of ours are the scientists uh, going to continue to find in the following years. And we say that they all belong to the genus of Homo and all of these species are humans distant relatives. 
but one of the species belonging to the homo genus uh, that will eventually, yes, evolve into our own species is, of course, um, the Homo sapiens, um, which uh, European scientists, you know, simply translated into or, or, or took the name Homo sapiens, Latin for the wise men, because we humans kind of uh, uh, modestly gave ourselves a title, I'm ironic here, gave ourselves a title of the wise to kind of separate ourselves, to separate humans from other uh, species within the Homo genus. Now, the catch is, um, and, and a very hotly debated topic in uh, evolutionary biology today still is, that we don't exactly and precisely know when and how our own species, the Homo sapiens, kind of evolved from these earlier types of species within the Homo genus. However, uh, scientists do agree that approximately 200,000 years ago, uh, again, in the East Africa, uh, that's where the first Homo sapiens will evolve. Homo sapiens that looked just like us, uh, which suggests that, again, this territory of Eastern Ethiopia, which earlier was the home of Lucy, is now also a birthplace of humanity as well. Um, and kind of relating back to this uh, idea or the title of quote unquote the wise men to be the translation of the Homo sapiens is the fact that um, Homo sapiens did look different in it or, or did uh, think differently perhaps in terms of its uh, a brain structure because Homo sapiens had larger brain, more complex brain than those species under Homo genus that came before it. Uh, which will allow for, among other things, uh, for better language and for also better social skills. And also, as the arrows on the map suggest, if you were to follow, like the reddish color uh, suggests the first appearance of the Homo sapiens. And as arrows suggest, Homo sapiens will start to migrate to other portions, to other continents, and they will reach the first Arabian Peninsula sometime approximately uh, 100,000 years ago, from which they will branch into the southern portions of Asia, also later in Europe, and then finally sometime between um, 12,000 and 15,000 BCE, Homo sapiens will also stretch through the so-called Bering Strait to cross into the um, North, what today is known as the continents of North and South America. Uh, so that's kind of like the brief story, brief history of the spread and migration of the Homo sapiens. But what will happen to other of these species under the Homo genus? Well, eventually um, all other species will disappear simply because us humans had made them disappear. We will kind of drive other species to extinction. It's kind of perhaps in the nature for Homo sapiens to kind of be destructive in this urge for us to populate and to survive, right? Sapiens were much more proficient hunters, much more proficient gatherers, thanks to having better technology, better tools, uh, also superior social skills. Remember, that's what distinguishes Homo sapiens from other species, uh, comparing them to other species under Homo genus, right? Um, and other species eventually, for those reasons, will slowly die out with the Neanderthalus um, dying off last. And therefore, over the past 10,000 years, we say that Homo sapiens is the only species um, or only species under Homo genus uh, uh, to survive uh, or to surpass all of the other species that at once, at one point in history, populated the planet. Now, before we go on to study the history of Homo sapiens, before we continue with that story, it is important to keep in mind here um, the official classification 
uh, of the prehistoric periods because this kind of helps us with the timeline. And the scientists who study history of Earth, history of you know different kinds of species and their developments, use a variety of systems to kind of classify and divide and further subdivide um, the time. And they will title the era in which the earliest humans appeared, Homo sapiens appeared, as the Stone Age. And they will even further divide the Stone Age into two different categories, and that is the Paleolithic Age, also known as the Stone Age, as well as the Second Neolithic Age, or the so-called New Stone Age. And they will kind of simply divide those uh, based on the category on the type of sophistication of tools used by humans and the types of activities, different activities that humans performed during these two distinct periods. So let's look at um, what was the characteristics of humans who lived during the so-called Paleolithic age. And during Paleolithic, uh, humans, Homo sapiens, just like other species of Homo genus who were still present during Paleolithic, were foragers, meaning that they predominantly um, depended on continuous uh, migration, or more plainly put, just like walking through the wilderness, walking through the woods, uh, predominantly hunting, um, and also searching for food supplies, gathering fruits, gathering berries, gathering uh, uh, any types of plants, right? And during Paleolithic, humans will predominantly use stones as tools, but also uh, uh, bones and other natural products they found in the nature to make said tools. And we like to associate uh, our early, early ancestor with this popular image of hunter-gatherer. Um, and we predominantly like to think that our early humans uh, predominantly hunted and killed animals to survive. However, um, uh, surprisingly, um, it was actually gathering and not the hunting uh, that was sapiens' main activity. And gathering of wild fruits, uh, wild berries, leaves, different types of greens, um, and, and insects, will provide uh, most of the early human's calor uh, calorie intake, right? So we ate more plants than we did uh, um, animals or killed and hunted animals during these early periods. And it was also during the Paleolithic era that humans will first start to express themselves through what we now know as the you know, arts and culture. Um, and this will include painting, this will include decorating walls, uh, decorating objects, making music, telling stories, sharing sharing stories, dancing, right? Um, and for example, there is evidence from Paleolithic age, particularly from about 50 to 40,000 years ago, which includes amazing paintings on the, on the, on the walls of different kinds of caves, uh, typically depicting animals, uh, a people, or different sorts of symbols. And scholars have long debated uh, the meaning and the purpose of the so-called of the so-called cave art paintings um, and other artifacts found during the Paleolithic age. And for example, uh, what you are seeing on the slide, you, you see two examples of these cave art paintings. On the bottom is the so-called image of hand stencils, which were found in uh, caves of France dated to approximately 40,000 thousand years ago. And these hand stencils were made by placing a hand on a wall and kind of blowing pigment through like a, a pipe or something. Um, and people perhaps did those things or made those paintings uh, to notify others who may be coming into this cave, coming into this area and say, hey, I was here. I'm waving at you, right? Um, 
And people may have also simply be recording what they saw in the nature, which is what's uh, exemplified in the image above, what they saw in the real life, and kind of leaving messages to others who may come and pass by and say, hey, in this area, there's bison, there's mammoths, there are lions, right? And other scientists also argue that these paintings suggest that these earliest of people had also developed a sense of the supernatural forces that kind of controlled some aspects of human life, which is why we say or believe um, that during Paleolithic, we also have the first instance of people accepting the idea uh, that there might be a force larger than them, right? Something that we now call spirituality or religion. And cave art proves perhaps that different spiritual men, different spiritual women will seek to communicate with this unseen world and then agree uh, uh, on, on the meaning of the or, or, or the or the existence of these supernatural forces. And some scholars also suggest that the cave paintings were actually created by shamans or people who kind of communicate with the spirit who will kind of retract back into these uh, uh, deep caves and enter this transcendental type of stage, making the drawings of the animals or any sort of uh, creatures that they might have encountered in the spirit world, right? And so that said, um, cave art might have been crafted for a variety of reasons. Um, and we might never know the meaning behind these paintings, but it's a record of human existence. And it also shows us that humans engaged in arts and culture and possibly even shared the belief systems or shared some type of religion. Now, hunting and gathering will remain the predominant occupation, basic way of life for human, uh, for, for a large part of history during Paleolithic until sometime between 950, uh, I'm sorry, 9,500 um, and 8,500 BCE. And during that period, humans will start to kind of transition to agriculture during the so-called Neolithic age. So we associate this second classification of the Stone Age, the Neolithic, with what we call the agricultural revolution, or this momentum when people will rely less and less on hunting and gathering for survival, and instead start to uh, do things like domesticate animals, um, and start to cultivate different types of crops for food and start to use tools made of stone as people did during the Paleolithic, but now also introduced wood into their tool crafting methods. So we go from food gathering to food producing. And the next question perhaps becomes, well, how did this happen? Why would humans trade a life of foraging, of hunting and gathering, continuous migration, moving around for food and supplies, and instead, during Neolithic, switch to a sedentary type of lifestyle, meaning kind of like staying in place and just cultivating your food in this one place? What made this change possible? And the answer is that approximately 10,000 years ago, um, the Earth's climate will enter a warming phase. It's nothing unusual. The Earth comes and goes through different stages of ice age and warm age. So climate changes. Um, and more parts of the world during that period, at this 9,000, 1500 BCE, uh, uh, more parts of the world were kind of able to support farming and this kind of lifestyle. So hunters or former hunters and gatherers would begin planting seeds in the ground along with, you know, uh, 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 
uh, with continuing to forging to some extent um, because of these environmental factors, namely, again, the warmer weather um, and mainly more predictable patterns of precipitation, more predictable patterns of, say, raining, right, which enabled um, a very suitable, more mild climate for uh, cultivation of different kinds of crops, and hence the agricultural revolution. And farming, the first traces of farming that were found evident were, again, um, in this region here that is known as Mesopotamia, uh, in the southeastern portions um, um, of, of countries that today are known as uh, Turkey, uh, Iraq, Iran, um, uh, or, or this uh, uh, territory that is also known as Levant area, okay? Uh, also known, there are many names for it, uh, the Fertile Crescent. Again, why in this area? Um, and perhaps because, again, climate was very mild there, um, making it a prime territory for the cultivation of grains, namely uh, uh, barley and wild wheat. Uh, they were kind of already abundant in this region, as were different types of nuts and trees and chickpeas and dates and pistachios dated back to 10,000 BCE. Um, first domesticated animals, in case anybody wonders, were the goats, approximately domesticated about 9,000 BCE. Um, and even today, with all of our advanced technologies that we have in terms of, you know, food production and processed foods and all of these different things we introduce to the market and eat as humans still today, more than 90% of the calories that feed humans still to this day came from this handful of plants that our ancestors will domesticate during the Industrial Revolution, meaning wheat, uh, uh, beans, corn, and things of that nature, all right? So agriculture revolution will start slowly, meaning that humans didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, we no longer want to be hunter gatherers. We're completely abandoning this lifestyle and we're just simply now just transitioning to agriculture. It was a slow and gradual process. And it was also not restricted to one geographical area. So it wasn't just Levant that became agricultural during this early Neolithic stage. Um, for instance, uh, people in, as you see on the map, people in Central America uh, and places that today, uh, among others, is the country of Mexico, right, will start to cultivate maize, meaning corn, beans, cacao, chili peppers. All of these were the native plants of that region. Also in China, um, people will start to cultivate rice. Also, they will start to domesticate pigs, uh, grow grains like millet, right? Um, and all of this is to say, that agriculture did not spring from a one single source because all of these pockets of agriculture, Europe, uh, Middle East, Asia, Africa, Americas, they will kind of develop independently. So it's not like someone from the Middle East, from Levant, travels to China and says, hey guys, agriculture is the thing right now, you should start doing this too. Rather, these centers will develop independently from one another, which is kind of fascinating. And this also happened approximately during the same age or during the same period, again, between 9,500 and 8,500 BCE. Now, most historians argue that the agricultural revolution was the greatest thing since the sliced bread. It was this great leap forward uh, well, for humanity. It was a story of progress. It was a story uh, of, you know, having the brain power to actually even start to cultivate vegetables. Uh, and, and people kind of abandoned this grueling and dangerous lifestyle of hunting and gathering. And instead, now they are able to sit down and enjoy the pleasant life as farmers. And it was overall that agricultural revolution is like the greatest things, greatest thing to happen.
However, uh, not everybody agrees with this premise. And some historians argue that agricultural revolution was one of the biggest mistakes that humans have ever made. Uh, and that the story of revolution and its progress are actually a fallacy or even history's biggest fraud, if you will. Um, and Oxford historian Yuval Noah Harari um, in his book titled Sapiens, The History of Humankind says this, uh, agricultural revolution left farmers with lives generally more difficult and less satisfying than those of foragers. Hunter-gatherers spent their time in more stimulating and varied ways and were less in danger of starvation and disease. The agricultural revolution certainly enlarged the sum of total of food at the disposal of humankind. But the extra food did not translate into a better diet or more leisure. Rather, it translated into population explosions and pampered elites. The average farmer worked harder than the average forager and got a worse diet in return. The agricultural revolution was the history's biggest fraud." End quote. Now, in ideal scenario, if we were in the classroom, I would have asked you whether you agree or disagree with this st statement. Certainly, there is some merit to his argument um, in that he argues that humans kind of had to adapt or adopt uh, to new cultivation methods. <clears throat> However, cultivating is demanding. Um, first, you have to clean the fields. Then you have to, <coughs> excuse me, plant on them. Then you have to plow afterwards. You have to spend hours um, of time through weeding, trying to, you know, make your crops survive through the season. Then you have to keep it safe from animals, from diseases. You have to fertilize with animal feces. All of that is messy. Why did we abandon this lifestyle and why why didn't we stick with hunting and gathering? Because it seems like we got a better diet out of the hunting and gathering. Um, and it doesn't, as it turns out, it's not like we just sat around because farming is really uh, uh, demanding. Anyone who knows anything about farming, who has ever spent a few hours on a field doing the farmer's work, agricultural work, knows that this is hard job, right? Um, however, agricultural revolution uh, uh, was still a significant moment in human history um, because the cultivation of all these different foodstuffs, the domestication of all these different animals um, will provide more food per unit of territory. And for that reason, enabled Homo sapiens to multiply exponentially to have a lot of offspring because if there is no food insecurity that means i don't have to worry about feeding my baby because i know if my baby uh because i know when my baby is born i will be able to provide for myself because there is a lot of food for me to eat whereas hunting and gathering is more or follows more unpredictable patterns right um uh and now that we have more food supply, um, we have more people. And more people also will mean that the first cities will emerge as well, meaning that the first civilizations will emerge as well. So perhaps contrary to Harari's agreement, without um, agricultural revolution, we may not kind of transition into establishing of the first large cities and the first large empires. So the history of those will become our uh, focus for the remainder of the lecture. And this is where we plug our story back into the map from the beginning, because now we are, as humans, Homo sapiens are present in Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia literally translates as the place between the two rivers, uh, namely Euphrates right here 
and Tigris right here. Um, and Mesopotamia, the term itself, is also used interchangeably with uh, the territory of Levant. I introduced this term earlier, and also the Fertile Crescent. And historians claim that it will be in this Fertile Crescent that people will build history's first cities, first of which um, will be in the region of Summer, which is this uh, a portion, the purplish kind of portion, at the southeastern tip of Mesopotamia. And so Summer, uh, in the following years in this region, uh, uh, different types of cities in the Summer region will develop. We have the city uh, of Ur, Uruk, Lagash, Uma, and Kish being kind of uh, uh, the, some of the Western civilization's first cities in cities all together. And these cities sprung up in part because of the need uh, for people to gather together and to organize in order to carry and to build the intense infrastructure that was necessary to upkeep the cities and to also upkeep the production of food for the cities. And people will actually first build cities for the purpose of building the first irrigation systems, because again, water was needed to support Mesopotamian agriculture, so to support all of those fruits and veggies and grains that people will start to plant during the agricultural revolution. And the cities developed um, between the two rivers because the river not only did it provide a, a very much needed hydration for the agriculture, uh, but also because it supplied uh, different types of food, including the fish, and also uh, the material called clay, which was used to make bricks, uh, which was Sumerian's primary building material. Um, and they also used it for uh, writing and for the record keeping. And as the years went by, as people began to produce more and more wheat, more and more barley, more and more lentils, um, they realized, well, um, we have so many bushels of wheat this season, we probably have to figure out a way to keep the track of it, right? We have to keep records of all the stuff we are producing so we know how much we have in stock and how much our city is able to support. And that is why the development of summer as you know, the Western civilizations, uh, areas of the first city is also closely associated with the development of the first systems of writing, which was perfected in Mesopotamia. So perhaps we can argue that the greatest invention of these earliest cities was the development of writing. So how did people so many millions of years ago keep track of things? Well, as early as 7000 BCE, people in Mesopotamia in summer will start to use small tokens made out of clay and also made out of stone, uh, forming many different shapes to keep track of, for instance, how many animals they have, uh, how many fruits and grains they produced each season, and so on. So writing was first again introduced to kind of keep inventory of the stuff. And then thousands of years later, by uh, 3500 BCE, government and different temple administrators of the city of Summer will start to use a simplified drawings, also known as the pictograms. And in pictograms, as you can see on the picture on the slide, um, each object, for instance, uh, a water, or for instance, uh, a two kind of wavy lines represent the word, a single word meaning water. Um, and these symbols could also be combined to have like a join a certain word, right? So for instance, uh, a sign for a mountain 
and a sign for a woman will be combined to signify the slave girl, okay? Uh, uh, because actually Sumerians will regularly obtain female slaves from the wars that they had going on with their enemies who typically lived in the mountains. Now, over time, um, these pictograms will evolve into a true systems of writing, also known as the cuneiform. And cuneiform was different uh, from pictograms in that rather than using a single simple sign to symbolize a whole world, uh, pictograms, uh, I'm sorry, cuneiform will actually uh, start to represent a particular sound which allowed for a more complex ex expression, kind of divorced from any particular meaning. And what you see on the slide um, is a clay letter written in cuneiform that was dated back to approximately 1800 BCE. So you might have a single sign representing a sound in cuneiform as opposed to a single sound representing a whole word, which was the case with the pictograms. And then if the development of the writing system is one of the hallmarks of civilization, so is religion. Um, because as people start to live together in these permanent settlements in the cities themselves, they will also start to share the same common language, the same common culture, the same kind of uh, 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 styles of belief systems, and hence uh, religion as well. So Sumerians and later other peoples as well in Mesopotamia will develop a religious system that was predominantly polytheistic, meaning that they will develop a belief system consisting of multiple gods. And they claimed that these multiple gods controlled uh, uh, human life. Um, and these multiple different gods represent different cosmic forces, forces found in the nature, such as the sun, the moon, the water, the storms. So they will attach a single deity, a single god, to a different representation in the nature. So hence you have the god of sun, the god of storms, the protector from thunder, and things of that nature. And each city generally um, will have a chief god or a chief goddess um, with, of course, a large temple having to be built in their honor. And as you will learn from one of the primary sources you are reading this week, the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, there always was a single god that was perhaps the main god, who was the most powerful, who was in control of everything. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, that god will be the god Enlil, who was believed to be the ruler of all other gods. Um, and also, just as the king of a city-state would have ruled his population, so this main god also ruled um, uh, its own systems of gods as well. And Mesopotamian civilizations were the first ones to believe that gods are judging good and evil, um, and they can punish humans depending on their behavior. And according to these early polytheistic religion, it actually wasn't just humans who suffered consequences for perhaps their bad uh, decisions. Because according to Mesopotamian religion, gods themselves will too suffer from their actions, and sometimes for no reason at all, just as humans did as well. So there's kind of a link between, uh, or similarity between human-like and the godlike, in that we all have to suffer for our actions. And people believe that humans were created to serve the gods, and they were also kind of expected to have a good life if they served their gods well. So there was this idea from these earliest civilizations that if you behave well, you will be rewarded after you pass away. 
And the best way to uh, get on the God's good side or to win a favor from a God is to uh, build a massive temple. And in Mesopotamia, they were known as the ziggurats. And ziggurats were these uh, uh, tier towers or temples uh, that Mesopotamians will build for their gods. And ziggurats had to be built, of course, as tall as possible, as wide, as impressive as possible, because people believed that the temple's size demonstrates not only the strength of this entire community, of this entire city, but also the closeness with their respective gods. So the, clo the, the, the bigger and the more grandiose your uh, temple is, the closer the god you will get. Now, because they formed their own religions and were concerned about the consequences in the afterlife, they also will create myths uh, to account for how the universe was created in the first place. In one of the earliest stories, or one of the earliest creation stories, um, was from the city of Babylon in Mesopotamia. And according to the Babylonian creation story, uh, there was this goddess called Timot, um, and she, uh, according to this belief, gave birth to all of the other gods. And when she got angry one day, she will try to destroy everything. Because as you will notice when you read the Epic of Gilgamesh 2, you will notice that sometimes gods have this erratic, unexplainable reaction to things. They just act as they please, right? So Timot wakes up one day, decides to destroy everything. However, the god Marduk who was the chief god of the Babylonians, will proceed to instead kill her to protect his society. And he will divide up parts of the Timod's body. And from these parts, he will create the world. He will create the sky. He will create the stars. He eventually, too, creates humans. And these myths, just like the Babylonian creation story, are the earliest examples of humans trying to tackle this question of how universe itself was created and how humans were created by gods as well. And a side note, uh, by now you might be drawing similarities between this creation story and uh, the Christian creation story. Um, this story of Babylon creation, Babylonian creation story, was recorded approximately 2,000 years um, before the Hebrew Bible, before the Old Testament, right? Um, and so that is to say that later um, the Hebrew society will um, use earlier Mesopotamian creation stories as a template for their, or as an example or imitation of their own creation stories. Um, and in addition to all these different stories about gods, the people of Mesopotamia also told stories about heroes, about kings. And many of these stories will be summarized in the so-called Epic of Gilgamesh, a text which, again, you are going to be reading as one of your primary sources for this week. An Epic of Gilgamesh was the first and the oldest epic, heroic epic poem that was written down. Um, it was first shared by Sumerians, and it came together approximately in the year 2000 BCE. An Epic of Gilgamesh uh, reveals to us that Sumerians were um, urban society. They kind of had uh, the clear organized sense of their community. They had a share, uh, under shared understanding of how gods will create with humans. And in this epic in particular, the epic recounts the wanderings of its hero, Gilgamesh, uh, who was the king of the city of Uruk, the city in Mesopotamia, and tells us about the kinds of things that he encountered 
in his search for the everlasting life. And he is faced with questions such as, you know, a typical religious quandaries, like what is the purpose of life? How do I uh, uh, reach the stage of eternity? Is there such thing as everlasting life? What happens to me after I die? Questions of friendship. How do I please gods? How do I please my friends? The deity, immortality in these kinds of questions, right? So Mesopotamians kind of tended to view the questions about life and life's origin, human creation, and man's role on, or people's role on earth um, uh, uh, as the same sets of questions, right? And you will discover how even the Epic of Gilgamesh also will serve as the inspiration um, for the later stories, the later creation myths uh, introduced in the, um, the Hebrew Bible, also known as the New Testament written, again, 2,000 years after the Epic of Gilgamesh, as well as the Babylonian creation story. Now, lastly, our focus will be on the political structure of these early civilizations in Mesopotamia um, and the Sumerians who will build the first cities, will also establish kind of the basic social, um, economical, and intellectual patterns for the entire region of Mesopotamia. And they will start to influence their neighboring cities. And out of it, there will be other cities in Mesopotamia that will later develop into the first world's empires. And empire here in this context is understood as a political entity um, in which one group of people comes along and takes over uh, and rules over the members of another group of people. Whether that group agrees to this form of political domination um, or not. So usually empires are made by force. Um, and so eventually, a collection of Mesopotamian cities will no longer be these independent uh, centers of power, but rather conquered by a larger entity known as the empire. And the world's first empire was the Akkadian Empire. And the Akkadian Empire will be ruled by the king Sargon, of Akkad, and it was established in approximately 2300 BCE. Now, King Sargon will conquer uh, a number of these independent Sumerian communities um, with what was probably the world's first permanent army, and he will go on to create a large state or a large empire out of these um, conquered territories. And Sargon, interestingly, will go on to uh, appoint his own sons as rulers to help him uh, legitimize and calcify his power. But even more interestingly, he will appoint his daughter and Hedwana uh, as the uh, ecclesiastical or as the religious figurehead, or she was kind of the head of the religious life in the Akkadian Empire, similarly to what, uh, say, priest would translate in a Christian tradition in the later years. And her father, Sargon, gave, will give her the title of the High Priestess um, in the southern portions of the Akkadian Empire, so in the city of Summer in particular, because he believed that if an empire has a personal representative in the region, uh, a diplomat of sorts, this will help the king kind of secure the power within the kingdom itself. So, and Hedwana, you know, perhaps she did not hold this independent political office on her own. She uh, was a religious figure, of course, but nevertheless, her role was unprecedented because it was very unusual for a woman at this stage in history to hold a religious office, which traditionally was reserved for men. 
And that is to say, like a larger significance of this whole story is that, you know, even the earliest civilizations, even the earliest societies were based on the social order of patriarchy, meaning that a society, it's a society in which the most power is held by its male population, most predominantly the uh, older adult men, um, especially those from elite groups like kings and rulers and emperors, right? Uh, nevertheless, and Hedwana found a way to make an impact in history um, in that she was the author of a number of hymns or uh, religious poems celebrating various different Mesopotamian gods and goddesses. And this was significant because this means that Enheduanna will be the world's first author to put her name on any kind of literary composition. Um, now you might have, you, you, we mentioned on the previous slide, the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? This poem was also written down and put on uh, uh, for people to read or for people to share. Uh, however, the Epic of Gilgamesh was um, uh, collected by multiple people or created by multiple people. Whereas here we have a single author, it being and Hedwana. And here is the excerpt from the poem or the hymn that she wrote. Uh, she says, quote, and she is writing this as a dedication uh, to a goddess, right? She says, quote, your divinity shines in pure heavens. Your touch lights up the corners of heaven, turning darkness into light. The men and women form a row for you and each one's daily status hangs down before you. Mistress, you are magnificent. No one can walk before you. I am Enheduanna, the high priestess of the moon god. Mercy, compassion, and care, lenience, and homage are yours, and to cause flood storms to open hard ground and to turn darkness into the light. Enlil, who, side note, is a chief god of summer, has determined a great destiny for you throughout the entire universe. Your great deeds are unparalleled. Your magnificence is praised. Young woman, Inanna, your praise is sweet. Right? So the first poem by a single author and Hedwana is in front of you. Okay? And so for hundreds of years... Um, and Hedwana's works were actually, uh, and the poem that you, the hymn you, you just re heard me read to you, um, was copied on clay tables, which have been found in several cities in the um, Akkadian Empire, perhaps suggesting that people might have recited these poems, these hymns, um, and kind of shown interest in reading them and had shown respect for um, the uh, office of the priestess or the office of Enheduanna or the, the person Enheduanna herself. Now, Sagan's uh, dynasty uh, will rule Mesopotamia for approximately 150 years. But after um, the, the, the dynasty of Akkadians will die out, the empire will collapse and another empire will rise to prominence in Mesopotamia. And that will be the Babylonian Empire, established approximately um, in the year 1600 BCE. And this empire uh, will consist of a few smaller kingdoms. And these smaller kingdoms will come together under a single king, the centralized power. This is one of the features of any empire. You might have separate, distinct sources of power throughout, but they're all united by a single king, the single empire. In this case, it will be the King Hammurabi. Now, according to the ancient Mesopotamian religious tradition, each king is supposed to link his or her success with the will of the god, meaning that if empire was to be successful, 
it was because gods wanted the empire to be successful, right? And uh, Hammurabi will connect himself with Mesopotamian King Shamash, who will be the god of law and justice. And Hammurabi consequently believed, as many rulers after him will believe also, that the emperor's power the emperor's right to rule comes directly from God, which is why we have to, us rulers, link ourselves with gods themselves. This was the birth of the idea that the king, perhaps, is anointed or uh, protected by the god, and that the king is God's direct representative on earth. So this moment in which Hammurabi claimed that his power to rule comes from God directly will kind of set a precedent in history for the future kings who and queens who will claim that they have the right to rule because God had appointed them to that position, the so-called divine right of kings, which will then later permeate um, to other regions of power, including Europe, um, for centuries later. Now, the majority of what we know about Babylonians under Hammurabi came to us because the Hammurabi will uh, write the so-called Hammurabi Code in the year 1755 BCE. This will be a very extensive law code or set of laws. Um, and we have to mention here that this was by no means the first time someone will ever come with a set of rules or a law that a certain society has to follow. Uh, we have evidence of early Sumerian cities who had also had their own legal systems written before the 1755 BCE. However, Hammurabi Code is significant in that it was definitely the most extensive, the largest, the longest legal code, and it will apply universally to a very large population at the time, meaning the Babylonian Empire, and therefore um, defining and regulating many aspects of human life. And it will uh, touch on the issues uh, such as um, how to trade with people, so how to conduct yourself on the marketplace, how do we pay people for what we owe them, um, also things like uh, uh, personal property, things like marriage, things like adultery, how to handle all of those things, how to handle family law. Um, and for example, it also sets a variety of punishments for breaking a particular law, including fines uh, and physical punishment for wrongdoing, also laws regulating um, uh, marital affairs, uh, telling us about the gender roles um, and how different layers of society uh, are supposed to behave and interact with each other and what certain expectations are of you depending on your uh, uh, status in society or also known as the class. So the code will not apply equally to everybody based on gender and based on your social status, meaning class, right? Now, it's kind of hard to say what the practical impact of the Code of Hammurabi was and how the laws exactly were enforced. However, uh, the Hammurabi Code does provide to us uh, a, a very much a wealth of information about what was the daily life like in Mesopotamia, how people interacted with each other in Babylonian Empire, and it shows to us um, the rules of the moral system, so the crime and the punishment for a certain criminal offense that will also be influencing uh, and be uh, emulated by the later civilization in the Near East, including the laws written down in the Hebrew Bible, also again inspiring the uh, Hebrew, uh, uh, the, the Old Testament, okay? And so I do believe that, yes, you do, you are reading um, the Code of Hammurabi uh, 
as one of your primary sources for this week. So you will kind of see precisely how the society was organized and how people in Babylonian Empire were expected to behave. Um, this is a good stopping point for us today. Congratulations, you have made it through your first formal lecture, and I hope that you will be clicking play um, for your next lecture, which will be posted a few days from now. Um, and I do hope to see you then. Until then, have a really great day and stay safe. Bye-bye.